Hello, Godot Tutorials is not sponsored by or affiliated with Godot Game Engine. In this episode, I'm going to go over the following. The first thing is I'm going to show you how I like to set up my project before I actually do anything. Second, I like to draw out what I want to code before actually coding. This is so in my head I can visually see what I will be attempting to do in code. And then third, I actually like to sit down and code what I drew out. Please keep in mind that this project will be uploaded to GitHub. The download link will be in the description down below. And lastly, before moving forward, I like to scan my code quickly and see if there's anything I need to clean up. Now, being a programmer in game development is an art form. What I mean is you can consider yourself an artist. And just like an artist, when you have an idea or a feeling inside of you to start drawing, you don't go ahead and actually start drawing. You plan it up and you start setting up for your art project. The same thing applies to programming as well. And so we're going to do our setup first. Obviously, we need to download our game engine. And if you've been following this series, hopefully you already have Godot downloaded. But next, since we are exporting to HTML, that means we need to have a web browser that supports debugging. Now, any web browser will do just fine. However, I like to use Google Chrome. So make sure you download Google Chrome. On top of that, we will be dealing with text files. In this case, we're going to download Roboto Lite, and this text file will be used for our dynamic font class when we start printing text to screen, basically player instructions. Next in the project, we need to open relevant documentation pages in the Godot Game Engine website. As programmers, we don't have to memorize every single API call. However, understanding which classes we may or may not need and having those opened up will help us when we're stuck on certain issues. After that, we're going to go ahead and set up our debugging web page. And then lastly, we're going to go ahead and create our Pong project in Godot. So first, you're going to go ahead and download Google Chrome. And this is because, again, we're going to use Google Chrome's HTML debugging tool. After that, you're going to go ahead and download the Roboto font family. In this case, I like to download my fonts from Google. And so in this case, if you go to HTTPS fonts.google.com, you can search for Roboto and you can click the download family button. On top of that, we're going to use the Lite 300 text format file. I'm going to go ahead and leave links in the description down below. Now, next, you're also going to make sure you have the Godot game engine downloaded. In this case, we're going to be using the standard version 64 bit not the mono version C sharp support version. On top of that, we're going to go ahead and open up tabs based on the nodes we think we may need in the future. So in this case, we're going to need the node API. The node API again contains all our virtual methods such as enter tree, exit tree, basically our game life cycle functions. Next, we're going to need the Node2D API. Again, the Node2D API contains our transformation values. This includes position, rotation, and scale. Since we are not going to use nodes, instead we're going to draw them onto the screen, we're also going to need the Canvas Item API opened up. The Canvas Item API comes with functions that allow us to draw onto the screen. For example, drawing lines, drawing circles, drawing our rectangles, and of course, drawing our string. Speaking of drawing strings, it takes in a font data type as the first argument. And so we're also going to go ahead and open up the font API class. The most important functions from this class will be the get height and get string size. Now, get height and get string size are important because we're going to need to know the height of our fonts that are drawn to screen. And we need to know the width of our fonts drawn to screen in order to center our string nicely for the player. Now, again, we're also going to need either a dynamic font or a bitmap font if we're going to draw to the screen. So in this case, I'm going to use dynamic font. So go ahead and open up the dynamic font API class. Now we are not going to use anything from the dynamic font API except for the font data to set which text file we will be using. In this case, Roboto Lite and setting the size of our font. In this case, size 24. Lastly, open up the OS class API. We're going to need its window size in order to get the width and height of our screen. And lastly, let's go ahead and take a look at setting up 
the developer tools for Google Chrome. Now you're going to go to the top right. You're going to see three dots. Go ahead and click that. Go all the way down to more tools, then head down to the bottom. Click on developer tools and on the right side of the screen, you should see something open up. Now let's make sure that our errors are persistently logged. What I mean by that is normally by default, if you were to get an error here and you were to refresh your screen, or in this case, our tab, you're going to notice that our error disappears. To fix this, go ahead to the top right, the first gear icon, click on that, go to preserve log and make sure that it is checked mark. Now, when we have an error logged onto our console and we click the refresh button, you're going to see that our error stays persisted. Now we can go ahead and close this drop down menu by clicking on the gear icon that is now highlighted in blue. On top of that, let's go ahead and fix our view of our HTML page. So in this case, on our left, this is our view. Now I'm going to go ahead and click this device button. It's called toggle device toolbar. Go ahead and click that. Make sure it's highlighted in blue and you should see this resizable and adjustable screen. The reason we want to be able to adjust this is depending on our settings in Godot, we should be able to change to see what our game may or may not look like when displayed on HTML. And this is dependent on how we're going to upload. In our case, what we're going to do is upload to itch.io. So in this case, I want you to go to the top right, make sure that responsive is checkmarked and Keep in mind that we are 1024 by 600 in the Godot application. I like to keep it at 100%, but if you feel that this is too big, you can always set the scale to a smaller size. It really doesn't matter in our case. We just want to see how our game displays on a web browser. But again, it's important that we set the size to 1024 by 600, which is the default size in the Godot game engine's new project. That's because when we upload to itch.io, we're going to have to manually set the iframe and we will be setting it to 1024 by 600. Now that we've set up everything, we can go ahead and start coding. But before you start coding, you should really draw out what you're going to do, or at least where are we going to place our items on the screen? Now, when we code in this episode, we're going to create a variable for screen dimensions, create dynamic fonts for drawing string to the screen, create player paddle on the left side, create AI paddle, which will be on the right side. Both paddles will be centered along the Y axis. Then we will create the ball, which will be centered along the X and Y axis of the screen, which is just the center of the screen. And lastly, we will create a string aligned to the top of our screen centered on the X axis. Now, if you're wondering how I got this list, it's because I like to draw out what the game will look like and start using math to come up with pseudocode. So let me go ahead and show you that. So over here, I have the player screen. It's just a rectangle. But visually, this screen has a lot of math going on. Now, over here, I have the screen dimensions. As you can see, we have a width, we have a height, both respectively denoted by the X and Y variables. And if we want the center of our screen, we have a formula, which is just X divided by two by Y divided by two. And of course, at the top corner, I have 90 degrees. This just lets me know that we need to be oriented with the screen if we're going to do simple basic collisions, which we will deal with in a later episode. Drawing it out is good because now we know the formula for centering our ball. Now let's go ahead and look at pseudocode for centering the ball. So again, I like to draw things out. So in this case, you can see here that I drew the ball in purple. Notice the light blue at the center. That is the pivot point for our ball. Pivot point again is where our ball will be oriented on the screen given an XY coordinate value. In this case for Godot GDScript, a vector two value. And of course, I have a radius set for our ball. This lets us know the size of the ball we will draw onto the screen. In this case, for our drawing, I set it to 10. We will be using the radius for a later episode when dealing with collisions. However, this value in this case, the value of R can change. The most important thing is just visually seeing that our ball has a radius. Now again, to center our ball to the player screen, we need to take our width of the screen divided by two, which will be the X value in the coordinate system and Y divided by two. And this will center our ball onto the screen. So as you can see here in pseudocode, our ball position is equal to X divided by two by Y divided by two. 
Let's do the same thing for the player paddle, which will be left aligned centered on the Y axis. So again, I drew what I think we'll need on the screen. In this case, I have our player paddle in purple, the light blue at the top left, which again denotes the pivot point. Now there will be spacing between the left edge of the screen and the player paddle. I given this the variable P, which is just padding, which again is distance from the edge of the screen. On top of that, I drew a width and a height and half height and of course, half width of the screen. Now, after we have drawn out what we're going to need, we can go ahead and create our pseudocode for the paddle position. In this case, paddle position is equal to on the X axis, just the padding value, because again, we need to move it to the right from the edge of the screen. And that is represented by the value P, which is padding. And now on the Y axis, in order to center our paddle on the screen, we're going to need two things. We're going to need the width of the player screen divided by two, which will take us to the middle of the screen. However, because our pivot point is up here, if we were to leave that value there, our paddle will actually extend further down than we intended it to. And so visually for the player, it will not be centered to the screen. So to fix that, we need to subtract half of the height of our paddle. And this is because in Godot, our Y value going down is a positive value. And so we need to subtract half the height of our paddle in order to visually give the impression that our paddle is in fact centered on the Y axis of the player screen. Now we can do the same exact thing with our AI paddle. And it's going to look similar for the Y axis coordinate value. However, in order to place our paddle to the right side of the screen, we need to do something differently. In this case, we have the X value or in this case, the player screen width. And so if we take our X value, we go all the way to the right. We need to subtract the padding we have for the player paddle and the width of our player paddle in order to get our paddle to be aligned almost mirror like to the player paddle. Now, if we look here, our formula shows just that AI position is equal to player screen minus padding plus the width by half of the player screen height subtracted by half of the AI paddle height. And so just by drawing it out, we can see how we are getting our formulas for the position of our drawings. And of course, again, we have to do the same thing for the instructional text. Because we're going to put our text at the topmost part of the screen, we need to have a formula for how we are going to place that. In this case, we have half of the player's screen width. We have a padding from the top. Also, when it comes to strings, they are usually placed in a, a box of sorts. And that's what's going to happen when we use dynamic font in Godot GD script. So with dynamic font, we will be able to get the height of our string container and the width of our string container. Now in Godot, text tends to have natural padding. So whether we need a padding value or not is up to you. In this case, I'm going to omit the padding value just because the Roboto text file comes with natural padding. Now, once we've drawn it out, we can sort of see what our pseudocode is going to look like for positioning our text container. So in this case, text position will equal to half the player screen width subtracted by half the text containers width by the height of our container. Now, if you notice here, we have a pivot point to the bottom left, and that's because I find that when dealing with dynamic font for drawing string, I find that it is bottom left. Let's get to drawing our game objects onto the screen. So first go ahead and create your project. In this case, I called my project Pong Basics Series. To the top left, you're going to see the scene tab. Go ahead, press 2D scene. You're going to see no 2D. Now that we've created our root node called no 2D, we're going to go ahead to the scene tab, press scene, scroll down to save scene. You're going to get a pop up, leave everything as is and press the save button and the scene should be saved in your file system tab. Now on top of that, let's go ahead and delete the icon. You can go ahead, right click, press delete and click remove. Now that that is out of the way, let's make sure that we can debug in HTML. Now by default, you cannot 
test in HTML or export in HTML until you have downloaded the necessary template files. Let me show you what I mean. Let's pretend you finished your project and you decided to export. To export, you go to the project tab, scroll all the way down till you see export. Go ahead, click that. In the menu, you're going to press the add tab, pick HTML5, go ahead, press that. And as you can see here, an error shows. And this error is letting you know that by default, there is no export template file at the expected path. Now, this error is simple to solve. Let me show you how. Let's go ahead and close that tab. Go ahead to the editor tab. Click on that. Make sure you scroll down to manage export templates. Click on that. And as you can see here, you should have something missing. We need to download this. So go ahead, press the download button. When the download is complete, it's just going to send you to a link because we will need to install from file. Go ahead, press this link. It should automatically download for you. When the file has fully downloaded, you're going to make sure that you know where your file was saved to. In most cases, it should be the download folder of your respective operating system. Regardless, we're going to go back to our game engine application. We're going to go ahead and close. We're going to click install from file and go to the exact file path where our file has downloaded to. In most cases, again, it will be your download folder. In this case, when you finally found your file template, you're going to go ahead, select it, make sure it shows here, and you're going to press open. Your system will then try to extract the template. And when it is finished, it will show you with a green text. Now we can press the close button to get out. And now let's head back to export again. Make sure that everything is working. Go to the project tab, scroll down until you see export. Go ahead and click that. And as you can see here, there is no error. But let's double check. By pressing the trash can icon and pressing the delete button, we can go ahead, remove that and redo the process. Go to the add tab, click on it, scroll down to HTML5, click on it. And as you can see here, there is no error given to us. This means that our template file is working correctly. Now, next, let's go ahead and set up our file system for the rest of the project. I'm going to go ahead, right click, press new folder. I'm going to call it Pong3. And this is because for each episode I do, I'm going to create a new scene with a new script and continue on so that way when you want to revisit a previous episode you are able to see the code at its full completion at what it was towards the end of the episode so in this case for pong 3 i'm going to click and drag the scene into pong 3 i'm also going to go ahead and create a new script i'm going to call this pong i'm going to click and drag this to the top of our no 2d in the scene tab i'm going to go ahead and save this Everything in this episode will be in the Pong 3 folder. Everything in the fourth episode will be in the Pong 4 folder and so forth. Now, let's make sure that our game is able to run. We're going to go ahead to the top right. We're going to press the play button. In this case, we're being prompted to pick a default scene. Press select. Make sure that we're in the Pong 3 folder. I'm going to go ahead, press no 2D. I'm going to click open. Make sure that we are being shown a gray screen. That's very good. Now let's make sure that our HTML debugging is working. Now, when you went ahead and downloaded your template file, or in this case, when you exported to HTML, what you did was you created this HTML5 icon. When you press this, your web browser should automatically pop up a new tab. In this case, localhost port 8060. In this case, we're going to go ahead and copy this. We're going to close this in favor of what we created earlier in this episode. We're going to go ahead and press this. And as you can see here, this is our game screen as it was intended to be. Now back to the game engine, let's start coding. I'm going to go ahead and press the file icon. I'm going to delete everything. We're going to start from scratch. In this case, let's make sure that we are extending from Node 2D. Let's go ahead and create our lifecycle scripts. In this case, we know we need a ready virtual method. I'm going to use the pass because it's empty for now. Next, we need to do the same thing for physics process virtual method. Again, with the keyword pass. Finally, because we are drawing things to the screen, we're going to call the draw method. Again, with the keyword pass to make sure that errors aren't showing. Now, let's start with what we need. And what we need is to make sure that we have the player screen width and height. So I'm going to create a comment. Now, in this case, we finished creating the comment. So let's go ahead and create our variables. In this case, we need a variable for the screen width. We're going to use the operating system global class file. This will get us our window size. So in this case, window size. Make sure that we do, in fact, get the X value because we're dealing with the X axis. In this case, you can also use the getter method, get 
Windows Size.x either. One is fine. Most important thing is to stay consistent. In this case, I'm going to stick with the getter method. Now let's do the same thing with screen height. In this case, we're still going to use the operating system global class. We will use the getter method. But we're going to append the Y because this is because if we only use get window size, what we're doing is we're getting a vector to data type. In this case, it's just going to be 1024 by 600 in vector two using the dot notation followed by the Y. We are just getting the width of our screen instead of a vector two. And to showcase this, let's go ahead and brute force. Now I haven't gone over brute force debugging, but basically anything that prints to the screen is considered brute force debugging. If you're not brute force debugging, then you are doing unit testing. We will not go over that in this series. Now, if we go here to the output, you can see that this is 1024 by 600, which means we are getting the values we need for screen width and screen height. Now let's go ahead and create variables for half of our screen. In this case, we have our screen width, screen height, half screen width, half screen height, and that's enough for our window. Now let's go ahead and start drawing to the screen. So in this case, let's start with the draw circle method. In this case, our position is a vector two, and just like our drawing, we're gonna be half screen width and half screen height. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Next on the list is our radius, in this case 10.0, and our color we're going to set to white using the global color class. Now let's go ahead and see if it's drawn correctly onto our screen. And just like our drawing, you can see that our circle is actually centered to the screen. So in this case, you could say that the hypothesis you drew is actually correct. Next, let's go ahead and draw our rectangle. In this case, the draw rect, it takes in a rect2 data type. I'm going to add the comma for my sanity, vector2 for the position and size. In this case, I just want to draw to the screen, and so I'm just going to type in values. But our size will be 10 width, followed by 100 height. We're also going to create our color, in this case, color white. And that should be enough to satisfy. Let's just make sure that we are drawing. And as you can see here, we do have our paddle on the screen, but now we want this in the middle. And so just like our formula, let's go ahead and create some variables. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the values we pass to our player paddle will be the same for our AI paddle. For example, the color, the width of the paddle, the height of the paddle. And so let's go ahead and create some paddle variables. So in this case, I'm going to create a comment to section of paddle variables. In this case, we do want a color. We're going to go ahead and make sure that that's white. We're also going to create player vector width and height. Okay, now that we have our paddle color and paddle size, next we need to create half of our paddle height. And that's because our formulas for positioning our paddles is reliant on getting half the size of our paddle. So let's go ahead and do that. Half paddle height is equal to paddle size dot y divided by two. And that gives us half of our paddle height. Lastly, let's go ahead and create our paddle padding. So in this case, we're going to do paddle padding and we're going to give it a value of 10.0. This is all we need in order to replace our hard coded values. So let's go ahead and delete that now and replace them with our variables. In this case, our script variables. So in this case, again, we need a rect2 value. It takes in two vectors. The first vector is position. So on the x-axis, we're going to use paddle padding. On the y-axis, we're going to do half screen height. And we're going to minus it with half paddle height. The next vector2 value will be the size. So in this case, we're just going to do paddle size. And then we're going to pass in paddle color. And this should satisfy our draw rectangle method. And if we press the play button, you can see that our paddle is now centered to the left side of the screen with a padding of 10 pixels, just like our formula in our drawing. Now let's go ahead and draw our opponent. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to do draw rect again. We're going to get the rect2. 
In this case, for our width, we need the screen width. We're going to subtract it by the paddle padding plus the width of our paddle. In this case, I'm just going to use paddle size, get the X value. Now that we've finished the width of our AI paddle, let's work on the height. It's going to be the same thing as our player paddle. In this case, half height for the screen. And we're going to subtract that by half paddle height. And that should give us its position. Next, we need to pass it in the value for our size. So in this case, it's just paddle size. After we've done that, let's go ahead and set the color. So in this case, paddle color, and that should satisfy our rectangle for the AI. And if we press play, we should see that our enemy AI is now oriented to the middle of the screen on the right side. Again, just like our drawing. Now, I want you to notice something here. Our draw rectangles use variables inside of the draw rect method, but our draw circle is a mix of variables and hard coded static values, or in this case, literal values. So let's go ahead and create those variables for the ball. Let's go ahead and create the radius and color for the ball. Next, let's go ahead and create the color for the ball. And let's go ahead and replace this. So instead of that, we're going to say ball radius. And instead of color white, we're going to say ball color. We're going to go ahead, press play. And everything is working as it should. So let's finish off with the fonts. So let's go ahead and section that off with a comment. Create the variable for our font. We're using the new method. And that's basically it. Before we can move on to actually using the font, variable, we need to import the font file we downloaded from Google fonts onto our file system. So in this case, let's go ahead, right click, scroll all the way down till you see open in file manager, click that. Once you've done that, you're going to go ahead and go to where you downloaded your Roboto files. In this case, you're going to pick light. So roboto lighttf Once you've highlighted it, you're going to click and drag it onto your file system. Let's go ahead and move that up and we'll leave it in the root directory for our game. Now that we've uploaded our roboto lighttf file inside of our file system in the root directory for our game, we're going to go ahead and create a variable for our roboto and we're going to load it. In this case, our file has been loaded into our variable called Roboto. Now we are using the load keyword because we need to load this resource and then apply it or insert it into our variable. Let me go ahead and change the name to Roboto file, a little more descriptive. Lastly, we need to create a variable for our font size. In this case, variable font size is equal to 24. Now that we have our variable set up, let's go ahead and edit our dynamic font class type in the ready virtual method. In this case, font data, and we're going to assign it the Roboto file. Next, we're going to do the size and we're going to set it to the font size. Now, once we're done with that, let's go ahead and draw our string onto this scene of our game. Now, from there, we can go ahead and actually draw to the scene. In this case, we need to pass it a font. So on top of that, it takes in a vector two for the position. In this case, we just want to show what happens. So I'm just going to do this, just pass in random values just to make sure that our font actually draws onto the screen and we need to pass it a value. We'll do the simple hello world and that's it. That's all we need to satisfy. Now I'm going to change this to 10 just so I can show you an example of where the pivot point is. So now when we press play, you can see that hello world shows in this case, 100 pixels X axis, 10 pixels Y axis, but notice how it's cut off. That's because our pivot point is not top left. It's bottom left. So let's go ahead and set those values. Now, in this case, we're going to need to create variables to hold the width of our font and our height of our font. But because we cannot set anything onto the ready virtual method, we'll just set empty variables here at the top level of our class. So in this case, we need a half width font. Now, on top of that, we also need a variable to hold our height values. So in this case, we'll just call it height font. Now, in the ready virtual method, we actually have to set this up because before now, the reason why we have to leave this empty is because we need to wait for the size and font data. Something 
to note is that string values, when we need to calculate the width or height of strings, it's a little complicated. That's because different characters have different pixel widths and pixel heights, and that depends on the font size you use. For example, 12 pixel size versus 24 pixel size for your characters. And it also depends on the type of font you're using. Are, are you using sans or are you using serif? So again, different fonts give you different pixel heights and different pixel widths for each individual character. Keep in mind that capitals range from about 10 to 12 pixels. Lowercase range from 6 to 8 pixels. Periods, commas range from 4 to 6 pixels. Before we can calculate the width and height of our font, we need to know one, what font are we using? And two, what's the font size? And of course, lastly, we need to know what our string value is. And so over here in font variable, we're going to do that. So in this case, variable string value, and we're going to leave it to hello world. And we're going to leave it to hello world. So in this case, once we have our font data and sizes set, we can go ahead and find out the width and height. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to use the font get string size. We need to pass it in string values so it knows what it's calculating for. In this case, the string value. All we need is the X value and we need to divide that by two. Now, on top of that, we also do need the height of our font. So Godot comes with something called get height. And that's basically it. Now, if we reach down here, we can get rid of the hard coded literal values and actually use our variables. In this case, we're going to do for the width, we need half of the screen width, half screen width. And we're going to subtract that by half width font. And then for the second value, we just need the height. And so height font. Now let's see if it aligns correctly. And there it is. Hello world is aligned correctly at the top. Our paddles are aligned correctly at the left, right? And our ball is at the center. So far, so good. But let's test it out in HTML. So let's go ahead to the top right, click the button, click run in browser. Huh, something's wrong here. Look at that, our hello world is very tiny at the top. Our ball is in the middle. Our paddles are in the middle. So everything's aligned correctly, but it basically it looks nothing like we had when we were running the debugger directly inside of the Godot game engine. And just to make sure, let's go ahead and refresh here. And it still feels a little off. It's still a little tiny, even though we're running in our 1024 by 600. So to find out what the issue is, it's better that I show you. But to prove it to you, let's go ahead and actually print that. So OS get window size. Now, when we play it here, you should see that it's 1024 by 600. However, if we were to run this in our browser and refresh, check that out. 2048 by 1200. Now, fixing this issue is quite simple. All we have to do is go to Project Tabs, click on Project Settings. On the General tab, scroll down until you find Display. Under Display, you should see Window. Go ahead, click that. You should see the size, our player screen width, our player screen height, 1024, 600. Scroll down. Under Stretch, we're going to pick Mode, Viewport. Now. When we set the stretch mode to viewport, what's happening is when our player screen runs, our viewport will shrink or expand to get the value to be the same values you see here under the size portion in our project settings. Now, you're not done here. Just because we said viewport doesn't fix everything. Let me show you. Even though we press play, everything's fine here. Everything is scaled to proportion, scaled to how we want it. But when we actually run on HTML, what should happen is it shouldn't even show. It shouldn't even fit. In this case, this is what it looks like when the stretch mode is disabled. When I hit refresh, you can see that things are cut off. And that's because our viewport has shrunk. But when we place our game objects, we're placing it on the sizes of 2048 and 1200. Now, fixing this is quite simple. Instead of using the operating system get window size, what we can do instead is we can get the root viewport. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So in this case, we're gonna get tree.get root. And then we're gonna get the size. Now, when we print this to the screen, what we should see is 1024 by 600. Now, let's go ahead, run this in the browser. And down here, you can see 1024 by 600. Let me clear this again so you can see. 
So 1024 by 600. Now, as you can see here, we solved the problem sort of. Now you have to remember that shrinking or stretching of the viewport happens after everything's loaded. And so even if we were to do something like this, get tree dot get root dot size dot X, it's actually going to throw an error. So what we have to do is either call the unready keyword, make sure that we call this and everything else that relies on it once everything has loaded and done with on the scene tree. In this case, we need to wait for get tree, get root to actually expand and shrink and apply itself. We need to wait for the viewport to actually load onto the scene tree. And then we wait for everything else. And now let's test it out. If we press the play button, notice how nothing changes here. Now, if we run it in the browser, look at that. Everything is in proportion, a little pixelated here, but that's okay. Now, lastly, let's just go ahead and start cleaning our code a little bit. So in this case, now, if we look here, I see something wrong. We have hello world. That's actually completely lucky that it ran just right. Let's use the string value. So over here, we can see vector two rectangle rectangle spans so much that we actually have to scroll. In this case, it's hard to read code. And one of the principles I taught in a previous series is the keep it simple principle or keep it super simple principle. Now, in this case, we're going to pull out the vector two values and assign them to variables. However, notice that we're reliant on the screen width, which has the onReady keyword. Now, when I make changes, in this case, this is called refactoring. I like to do it one step at a time. So in this case, vector two, I'm going to pull out, put it towards the bottom. Now I'm going to use the onReady keyword followed by var, followed by a variable name. In this case, I'm going to call it ball vector, which has our position, by the way. And so probably should rename that to ball position. And we're going to assign it vector two half screen width, half screen height. Now I'm going to take the variable ball, replace this or refactor it, press save, press the play button, make sure that nothing breaks one step at a time. Now I'm going to put ball variable, make sure that we separate our values. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the player paddle. Go ahead, pick our player paddle. It's this right here. Going to copy and paste it, probably copy and paste it wrong. That's how big this code is. It's a vector two inside of a rec two. Same thing on ready keyword, followed by var, followed by player position. I'm going to copy paste that, replace this big ugly line of code with a smaller line of code, make sure it works. And it does. Okay, now that we got our player position ready, we're actually going to change the name. Instead, this is going to be player start position because everything's centered. I'm also going to replace this because it's throwing an error. And now we're going to have another on ready variable called player position. It's going to be vector two, and we're just going to copy and paste this. And this paddle size, we don't really need to call it inside a vector two because it already is a vector two. So I'm going to go ahead, change that player position paddle size. Now, if we press the play button, you can see that nothing's changed. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for our AI paddle. So AI paddle. I'm going to just get the ready. Same thing. AI position. After that, we're going to do the AI start position. And we're going to copy and paste again. Get rid of the vector too. We don't need it because paddle size is already a vector. Make sure that our start position is inside our draw function. Press the play button. We always want to make sure that our changes hasn't broken anything. Constant debugging. Lastly, we're going to do the same thing for the string value. However, it's going to work a little differently just because our string value requires height font and height font is set in our ready virtual method. Now, in this case, let's go ahead and create a comment. And we're going to set our variable called string position. And towards the bottom of our ready virtual method, we're going to go ahead, copy paste this. We're going to set our string position in the ready virtual method. We're going to copy the string position. We're going to paste it here. We're going to refactor it. So now our draw method is clearer. We're going to press the play button, make sure everything works. And yes, hello world still up there. On top of that, we're going to make sure that when we run in browser that everything's fine. And yes, yes, it is. Now we're going to do one more thing, one more thing. So you see this draw method. Now what we're really doing is we're creating a starting position. 
And so in this case, we're going to create a function. And we're going to call it set starting position. And we're going to copy all of this. We're going to call our method here. And now when we press play, we start in the starting position. And this is good because when we actually create our game further along, we're going to create states in which we need to reset everything on the screen. And this is basically it. Now, at some point, you need to tell yourself to stop cleaning code. Just keep in mind that as long as it's good enough, and in this case, everything fits along just fine here. We don't really need to scroll. If anything, we can also expand. And as you can see, there's not really much scrolling you need to do. Maybe the AI position value. But again, if it's too long, you can also hit the return. You can use two lines to do your unready variable. It's not going to break anything, by the way, if you do that. That is okay to do. At some point, you just need to move forward. Don't get stuck on perfection because perfection is the enemy of progress. Now, I will be honest, I'm not excited about the variable name for the value that holds our rec2 data type that we pass into our draw function. So I'll make one last change. I'll just call it rectangle. I think that AI rectangle is more descriptive of what this variable is. The problem and the irony is, is that we use the data type in the name, which I don't like to do. If anything, I would actually do something like this, AI rec2. Now, this is a little better when it comes to naming convention because it actually holds our AI object. It holds everything that it is, the position and the paddle size. And we just pass this in to the draw rectangle function for the game engine to draw to the screen. Regardless, I'm just going to leave it as is. We'll just settle with that until a better name comes along or until we reach the end of the project in which I'll refactor it using declared data types on the variables. And of course, when you change the name, just keep in mind that we're also going to throw errors because these things don't exist down here that should clear the error. You may also have a warning to fix that. You just have to put the underscore in front of Delta, let the game engine know that even though you use the physics process virtual method, you aren't going to be using the Delta function. And that's it. I'm basically done. In the next episode, we'll be going over basic state machines. So in summary, when cleaning up your code, don't focus on perfection. Perfection is the enemy of progress and you need to progress to reach the finish line to finish your project. And more importantly, this includes variable and function names. It's perfectly normal for your variable and function names to evolve over time. And this is because over time, as you use your variables and functions in more places inside of your code, you will get a better sense of what those variable names should be. Now, what I did earlier is a refactoring technique called variable extraction. Variable extraction is taking a complex coding phrase and simplifying them with variables. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So on the left side, we have our code. If player health is less than 100 and player health is greater than zero. So basically, if our player health is between zero and 100, we want to do something. Well, with variable extraction, what we do is we pull out the code in yellow and put it inside a variable. In this case, variable is alive is equal to player health less than 100 and player health is greater than zero. What this will do is it will return back a Boolean value into the variable called is alive. And from is alive, we put that inside our if statement. If is alive, do something. The reason you do variable extractions is because you want to make your code readable. In this case, if is alive describes or self documents to the programmer what this if statement will do versus if a programmer has to read this if statement. Both mean the same thing, but the one on the right is easier to read than the one on the left. So the one thing about code refactoring is that if you are able to refactor in one direction, then refactoring in the opposite direction is also available to you as a tool. Now, in this case, the opposite direction of variable extraction is called variable insertion. And so variable insertion is taking a variable and inserting it into a coding phrase. Now, in this case, this is our code right here. Variable is dead is equal to player health less than zero. If is dead, do something. However, if we were to do variable insertion, another name for that is also called 
inlining variables. And what we do is we take out the variable, we keep the logic player health less than zero, and we insert it into our if statement, if player health is less than zero. And so both do the same thing. Arguably, the one on the left is a little cleaner than the one on the right because we get rid of one line of code. So in a sense, code refactoring or cleaning up code is an art form. There's more than one way to write code. There's more than one way to clean code. Over time, you may find yourself refactoring in different directions as your code grows because over time, certain decisions make more sense than others. Now, if you are a little confused about when to refactor, that's okay because again, it is an art form. Just keep in mind to focus on finishing your project rather than focusing on the perfect line of code. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for clicking the like button and thank you for clicking the subscribe button. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.